I am Georgia Dunstan, professor of microbiology in the College of Medicine and the founding director of the National Human Genome Center at Howard University. I want to begin the talk this evening on genomics and self-discovery of identity with a short video on the National Human Genome Center to set the stage. The National Human Genome Center at Howard University, exploring the science of genomic information coded in DNA sequence variation expressed in population diversity and personalized in human identity. country that eliminated polio and mapped the human genome to lead a new era of medicine, one that delivers the right treatment at the right time. So tonight I'm launching a new precision medicine initiative to bring us closer to curing diseases like cancer and diabetes. The human genome is the encyclopedia of life and healthy living. The human genome conveys the message of the living genome regarding life, spirituality, diversity, and healthy living through science, sequence, and society. Exploring the science of genomic information encoded in DNA sequence variation and expressed in population diversity. Knowledge that is now revealed in genome sequence variation, big data, speaks as an oracle on genomic information encoded in and expressed through all human life, past, present, and future. The mission of the National Human Genome Center in its second decade is to do the science and teach the knowledge gained from big data on DNA sequence variation and its interaction with the environment and the causality, prevention, and treatment of diseases common in African Americans and other populations of African descent, a natural experiment of nature. Population diversity, a natural experiment of nature. This evening, I want to relate the Human Genome Project to the title of this TED Talk on genomics for self-discovery or genomics and self-discovery of identity. And then to relate that to human genome variation, which is fundamental to population health fundamental to the resilience that we see in our population and fundamental to recovery. And how this then relates to the mission of the National Human Genome Center at Howard University. Today, we are now in the era of precision medicine and the role that the genome plays in the quality of health and with regard to this TED theme, its role in recovery. Since we have a mixed and a diverse scientific audience, let me begin by giving you a working, my working definition of the genome. The human genome to me is sacred. It is the, I like to say, the quintessential gift 
of life. It is the complete set of instructions that each of us inherits from each of our parents at the moment we begin this cycle of biological life as a single cell. And we all come the same way. When the egg, which has in its nucleus, the mother's egg, has a set of 23 chromosomes, is fertilized by the father's sperm, and a functioning cell is programmed to begin to unfold the secrets, the knowledge, the information of how to make every part of the body and how to put those parts together to give the working order that we see in life. All of that information is in that single cell, two complete sets, one complete set from the mother, one complete set from the father. I begin here with the end of the Human Genome Project, which officially ended in 2003. It was a project by an international team of research scientists with the goal of determining the sequence of the human genome. That's the order of the biochemical molecules that make up the genome. Three billion, 10 to the ninth parts. And the goal of the project was to determine the order of those parts. And those parts, three billion, consist of four different chemicals. So any of you who do uh, uh, jigsaw puzzles can imagine when I get to what, uh, 500 pieces, I'm getting taxed, and then 1,000 is a tax. But the job of the Human Genome Project was to put in sequence order 3 billion nucleotides. And here we, you see an uh, example of the cell at the top with its genome in its nucleus. The chromosomes contain the genetic information, DNA, which has been sequenced. The DNA codes for molecules, proteins, that are the workhorses of the cells. These proteins work together as shown here in the different colors, the green with the red with the blue, work together to form a molecular machine. And those machines carry out the function to make a living cell. If you look at the inner circle, this is a replay of what has been the product of the genome project, which was to look at the molecular composition of the cell. And you'll notice that within the cell, you have the nucleus that contains the chromosomes that make up, the, that contain the DNA with the information for making the parts of the body, when to make them, how to make them, how much to make. All of that information is in this sequence. And the prevailing characteristic of this sequence it is, is this pattern of variation. We read the information based on patterns of these four chemicals that make up the DNA. I put this slide here for you to show the fundamental place of our genome in not just biological life, but all of life. Within the cells, we know in biology, in its hierarchy, cells work together in community to make tissues. Tissues work together to make organs. Organs work together to make systems. Systems work together to make individuals. Individuals, although we see boundaries on the individuals, individuals are not random. Individuals are related in families. Families are related in populations. Each level of organization gives expression to a higher order of life that it is nested in. I really personally do not think that it takes a PhD. If we recognize that there is order in life from the micro level of the cell 
through every level of organization to whole populations to make a sequential step that humanity itself is nested in yet a higher order of life that it gives expression to. We choose to call that e-life. E-life for us is used for electron life because we are looking at the life of the electron that makes up the atoms, that make up the molecules, that make up the cells. And it is through collaboration with professors and students here at Howard, led by our Department of Physics that I will mention later, that have given us this view of life from that which gives rise to all that we see. We are indeed unlocking the mysteries of life and I would have you to appreciate that the genome is fundamental to its all. And moving through, the human genome then is character structure, is its pattern of variation. It's all about life, biology, and identity. And I would say that with completion of the Human Genome Project comes a new knowledge base for life. It is a knowledge base that is as old as humanity and yet as, as new as the most recent discovery. I include this slide just to show methods that have been used to study and find the information in the genes. The goal of the Genome Project being to find all the genes that code for all the products that make up the body with the promise that if we find the genes, we'll have another way of dealing with disease in any part of the body. This slide is just to show that diversity is most in African people. I would want to move on. This is a slide of the, a, a study that, uh, a conference that we had at Howard. And this conference brought to front how we use patterns of variation in the genome to look for genes. In this day, after decades of research, we are poised to enter a new era of medical practice where detailed genetic and other molecular information about a patient's disease is routinely used to deploy effective patient-specific remedies to treat it. We are about to enter the era of precision medicine. There are critical questions to be asked about um, our behavior in this area. I want to point out here in closing that we have found that ancestry, your culture, your ethnicity, all of these are important. The genome does not code for life by itself. The genome is always acting in an environment. And it is critical that we be able to define the elements of the environment that interact with the genome as much as to find the genes themselves. And importantly, and why Howard University Center, culture is a key area. What people believe, how they think. When we study life at the electron level, we're looking at thinking and feelings, and we're looking at energies. And we also are in the era of the brain initiative and we have the science and the technology now to begin to map how a person's thinking influences their biological activity. And the knowledge for decoding this genome is resident broadly in people of African descent. And I must move on. And this, these slides just reiterate what I'm saying. We have to participate in clinical trials because the trials are the best way to get the best knowledge for how to apply the science. And uh, I would want to underscore the statement for the Genome Center. We use human genome variation not only for discovering genes, which we do, that's the mainstream, but this genome has come to us to, to challenge us to think about how we define ourselves 
and how who we say we are is instructions for our genome. We have science now to actually know that the genome is operated and regulated by the way we think and the way we speak. These are energy. And we can now use science through developments with the brain to actually show relationship and how a university is unique in its capacity. I identify here our biophysics, which uh, that is looking at this electron level. And I will close with this quote from Albert Einstein. Keep in mind the genome, like everything else in the universe, is made of energy. And Einstein states that the significant problems we have cannot be solved at the same level of thinking with which we created them. We define the human genome as a living, sophisticated information and communication system, the most sophisticated known to man. At Howard University, we engage in shifting the paradigm from the biochemical to the biophysical from the natural to the supernatural, from the molecular to the electronic, from the body to the soul, from translation to transformation, from disease, death, and dying to health, life, and living. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is so interesting. Um, I was reading today about epigenetics, mm -hmm. and my work is in language and environmental conditioning around language. And I was a little concerned about the epigenetics and the way that it was moving, uh, which is basically the work that you're talking about in recognizing the environmental factors on the genome our DNA and how that's mm -hmm. being passed down. Mm -hmm. So if you could just maybe speak for a minute on uh, developing that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that, because it does give me a chance. Let's make the distinction for those, again, who uh, it's a broad background. Epigenetics is um, looking at expression of the genes or what the genes make. And we want to find the gene, but we're interested in what does that gene do that causes it to be associated with disease? So epigenetics is the hottest, fastest, because it's all about knowing the environment, and not just your physical and chemical environment, but your energetic environment, which includes your psychological factors. I, I would go so far as to say science shows that the genome is voice activated. And we have to begin to look at the relationship, use our science to show your genome is your servant. It takes what you say is real, and its job is to give you the experience of that reality. The truth is, then, that we have to think about what we think about. We have to think about what we say because the genome does not make any judgment. It will just take the power source that it is and give you that experience. That's true. It makes you wonder, what can I think about? And use science to show the biology gives you a correspondence. Yes, so. Hi, um, my name is Daisa Grant. Um, my question is, um, my mom, she has breast cancer, brain cancer. So. She had breasts uh, in her brain and her breasts, and now she has it in her back. My question is, how, um, how does the genome work for her if they cannot catch it before it's spread it mm -hmm. throughout her whole body? Mm -hmm. how, how does that work? OK, thank you again for that, because this is a key point. You have to appreciate the state of our knowledge. Even our thinking that there's a gene for something as complex as cancer. Based on the fact that there are some folk that we've been able to associate that they have a particular gene, have a higher incidence. And I do stress incidence. It's that kind of thinking that is outdated 
in genomics. It's that kind of thinking that relates not only to breast cancer, but people, races. One of the first things that, that uh, the genome revealed was, I, I don't know what you mean by a gene for African American, if you will, if I can put it that way. The point I'm making is it, the state of our knowledge. It is incomplete, and it is not possible to yield the outcomes that we are looking for in any kind of predictable manner. It's almost like the very fact that you're describing is challenging us. Can you think bigger than basing reality on what you can measure? Because what you measure in the best of your science is infinitesimal compared to reality. Are you open to learn more about the parameters of reality, such as the way you think, the way you speak, and how those as energies turn on receptors? We haven't studied that in science. My point is, so the anomalies are there because the data is so incomplete. Thank you. Okay.